here? We are in a class called How to Study the Bible. There, We may not have a, a, enough folders, but there's a lot of these white folders scattered around the room. Grab a hold of one if you don't have one. And uh, we're going to follow some uh, sheets as we go through our class tonight. Um, we're going to... I want you to write on your sheets and... Uh, You'll get more out of this if you'll do that. Okay. Now, uh, we're going to first look at this uh, sheet we did last time and do a little better job of it. Uh, Last time we talked about the relationships between various books in the Scriptures. And we talked about the fact that in the Old Testament particularly... You can read, you need to know the storyline of the Old Testament. And these books right in here contain the story of the whole Old Testament Genesis, Exodus, Numbers. If you have trouble with some of these, this is Joshua. And the place this is Judges, this is Judges. So we got Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Joshua, Judges, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel. This is 1st and 2nd Kings right here. 1st Kings and 2nd Kings. So you write on your sheet there, 1st Kings. And Second Kings, and then of course you have the exile, which is the Babylonian captivity, and you have Ezra and Nehemiah, which tells you the story of what happened after the Babylonian captivity. So in these books alone, if you want these, the story: Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, uh, Kings, First and Second Kings, Ezra and Nehemiah. Those are the books that tell you the story of the history of the Old Testament. Now, along with those books, you have uh, the books of First and Second Chronicles that kind of capture or recap the entire story. Come on in here. You look different than you did. You had to open it. They capture the story of the entire uh, Old Testament, but they basically tell the story of what was going on with the priesthood and the tabernacle and the temple and the worship in the temple during all of this time. See? So First and Second Chronicles is a rehash of the entire story of the uh, Old Testament. If any of you ever try to, when you were in school, instead of reading the book, you just read the cliff notes, I know none of you ever did that. But if you want to just read the cliff notes, read First and Second Chronicles. <laughs> and if you want to read the book, then you've got to start with Genesis and go all the way through and read the storyline. Now, that's not exactly true, but there's some... There's some truth in that. Okay, so that's where the story is. Now, some of these other books, that, uh, like uh, Leviticus and Deuteronomy, see, they go with Genesis, Exodus, and Numbers. But the book of Leviticus is not a story. The book of Leviticus is how do you kill a bull and what do you do with its innards when it's a uh, burnt offering? And what do you do, come on in, Rick, Wendy, what do you do when it's uh, a peace offering? And we got chairs up here or back there. And... Uh, it's, uh, you know, what, is, uh, what are the laws of clean and unclean? And so it's not really part of the story. It's laws that were given while this story is going on, see? Deuteronomy is a sermon. The whole, whole book of Deuteronomy is a sermon. It is Moses' last sermon before he goes into the... Uh, he dies up on Mount Nebo and the people go in the land of Canaan. Deuteronomy is basically a rehash of what happened in Exodus and Numbers. See? And he's saying, now look at all this stuff that happened to, the, to you people and learn from it. But Deuteronomy is a sermon. So this is laws and this is a sermon. These books up here have the story. Now, the exception to that is the last chapter of Deuteronomy that has Moses going up on the mountain and dying. And that's part of the story. But, uh, of course, Leviticus and Deuteronomy go with these books right up here. Now, some people would put Job back here because they think it's really old. Uh, They think that because Job is in the patriarchal kind of a system, he's the father offering sacrifice for his sons. But I think what they're not thinking about is that the Edomites, the descendants of Esau, were never under the law of Moses. They continued to be under the patriarchal system. So we have no idea really what the date of the book of Job is. It may be somewhat later, but probably one of the earlier books. But it's kind of a free floater out there. And as we talked about last time, uh, I believe that the events in Job are historical events, but you need to write down next to this one that the form of this book is a play. The book is presented as a play. And the way you might, uh, it's, a, it's a drama. 
And it's, it's structured and everything like a drama. And the way you might think of this is, obviously there are some <clears throat> historical events in the history of the United States, like the death of Lincoln, you know, the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. There have been plays made that reenact the assassination of Lincoln. It was a historical event, but it's in the form of a drama. That's what the Book of Job is. It's, a, it's poetry, and it is in the form of a drama. So it, um, we're not denying the historicity of it. We're just saying that that's the literary form of the book, and that's the way you have to approach that book. Now, um, when, we, when we look at the relationship up here between uh, these story books and the prophets, see, the prophets are messages that were preached at different times. Now, when we talk about the prophets on this chart, we're talking about the preaching prophets. Uh, this is Amos and Hosea and Joel and Micah and Isaiah and uh, Zephaniah. This one in here is Zephaniah. Sorry about that. And Habakkuk and Jeremiah and Jonah and Nahum and uh, I don't know what, the, Obadiah. That's what that one is. Obadiah and Daniel and Ezekiel and Haggai and Zechariah and Malachi. Now, last time, uh, for example... Remember that we talked about the fact that the very last books of Old Testament history are Ezra and Nehemiah. And the prophets that go with those are Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. But particularly Haggai and Zechariah. Now to, to illustrate that one more time, just so you get it, look again at, at Ezra chapter 5, verse 1 and 2 in your Bible. Ezra chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Everybody be sure to check your name off or put it down if it's not on there. Ezra 5, 1 and 2. What does that say? Brother Monty, have you got it looked up on your telephone? No, no. Okay. Joel, you got it right there? Well, somebody's got to have it here. Tommy Clayton, how come you don't have a suit and tie? Go ahead and read your passage here. Now, Haggad, the prophet, Zacharias, descendants, all right, that's good enough. So there you are reading the book of Ezra and the story of what's going on in Ezra and who's preaching during the story of Ezra. Well, Haggai and Zechariah. And you know, if you said your Old Testament books and you was almost done, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. You know, those next to the last two guys are the guys that are preaching during Ezra and Nehemiah. I'm not making it up. It's for sure real, okay? So, these prophets go with those books. See? Now, why did they, in our, in our order, why did they put Ezra and Nehemiah way up here and then Haggai and Zechariah way down there? It's just the way they were thrown in the cabinet. That's all. Order is not anything divine. It, uh, the scrolls themselves are divinely inspired. The order that we put them under some cover is just an act of men. So um, I'm going to show you how the Jews put them in a better order here in a little while than what we do in our, in our English Bible, but these go together. Now, you see this part here that says the exile. Let's zoom in on this part of the chart here just a little bit. The exile. This is the Babylonian captivity that happened in the Old Testament at about 586 B.C., uh, some captives went in a little bit earlier than that. Uh, it ended in the, uh, about between five, about 520 B.C. or something. See, some captives went in as far as, far back as like 590-something. So there was a 70-year period in here. But after the Babylonian captivity, when they returned from uh, Babylon and went back to Jerusalem, you have Ezra and Nehemiah and these last prophets. Daniel was a captive during the captivity. See, he was there in Babylon with some of the Jewish nobles, with uh, Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah, otherwise known as uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know. And uh, he preached through the rules of Nebuchadnezzar and uh, Belshazzar and Darius the Mede and Cyrus the Persian, and then the Jews got to go home, see. Uh, Ezekiel went into captivity even before Daniel. And um, when Ezekiel writes the book of Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 1, verse 1, he says, In the thirtieth year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, when I was with the captives by the river Kabar, 
heavens were opened and I saw visions from God. So Ezekiel was a captive and he went into captivity even before the destruction of Jerusalem, even before the book of Jeremiah is over with. Ezekiel was already in captivity, see? And uh, he heard about the fall of Jerusalem as a captive over in Babylon. Twelve years or something into the captivity, somebody came and said to Ezekiel and all his group, Jerusalem has fallen, you know, and it's destroyed and the temple is gone and everybody else has been taken captive. So Ezekiel and Daniel are what we call exilic prophets. They are, they are during the Babylonian captivity and a lot of the stuff that Ezekiel and Daniel are about is about the sins of Israel and why they came, had to go into the captivity and uh, how God wanted them to straighten themselves up so he could bless them again and all that kind of stuff. Now, while we're talking about Ezekiel and Daniel, turn to Psalm 137 in your Bible. Psalm 137. Now, see down here in this bottom part down here, uh, while we have the story books on our chart, we have songs and poetry of Israel down here. You see this on the chart? Songs and poetry. All right, while the story was going on, people were writing songs. I mean, back in the time of Moses, Psalm 90 was written by old man Moses. See? He wrote a song. And people sang that thing all through the generations of Israel. David wrote lots of different songs. And people sang them in David's time and after. Um, a lot of different people wrote psalms in the book of psalms. It's a song book. And I was, and by the way, it's spelled differently. And I'm sorry about the Spanish, but I didn't want to have to redo everything. And this is, you can just relabel this one right here, psalms. You can sound it out, psalmos, so you can get that that's what it is. But uh, psalms. Psalms is a song book like our song book. And every individual psalm is an independent unit. Just like song number 71 in our book is completely independent from song number 72, probably written by different authors. You with me? So the Psalms, unless there's some special case, there's always an exception to every rule. That's why, that's why when people ask me to pronounce rules, I almost always say, well, generally this is true, but there's almost always an exception. For example, Psalm, 41 and, uh, Psalm uh, 42 and 43 are the continuation of a single work. But that almost never happens. See, almost all psalms are independent. Those two are the exception to the rules. See, so there's always an exception uh, to when you start making rules. But anyway, uh, the psalms are songbooks. Now, Psalm 137, Brother Gary, read a little bit there for us. Uh, uh, go ahead. Starting out? Yes, sir, right in the first verse. You read King James. Okay. Uh, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept. When we remembered Zion, we hung our hearts upon the willows in the midst of it. For there those who have carried us away captive required of us a song. Those who plundered us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. Remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who said, Raise it, raise it to that, its very foundation. That's raise it means destroy it, destroy right. it. Hey, that's right, keep going. O daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed, Happy shall he be who repays, repays you as you have served us. Happy shall he be who dash, takes the dashes, your little ones, against the rock. Wow. How about singing that one in church? Okay. But if you look at uh, the first verse, obviously that song was written during what period? Babylonian. The Babylonian captivity. See, so that song was written 
after, way down here after they were already carried away in captivity by some unknown captive, probably one of the Levitical singers that worked in the, in the temple music industry there, went singing the psalms in the temple while the sacrifices were, and he's remembering Jerusalem and remembering the destruction of Jerusalem and bitter against those who were supposed to be his brothers that helped the Babylonians in taking them all away captive, see? So this particular song was written during that Babylonian captivity time. So what I'm trying to show you is the different psalms relate to different parts of the Bible story, depending on when that particular psalm was written. Psalm 90 was written by Moses. So you could relate Psalm 90 back to Moses climbing up Mount Nebo or getting ready to die or back in the, in the Pentateuch in the book of Deuteronomy, see? But uh, this psalm, Psalm 137, goes way down here with uh, Ezekiel and Daniel and Ezra and Nehemiah at the end. You see what I'm saying? So the song book is over the whole map. And the different individual psalms, like if you read Psalm 51 about the repentance of David over the sin with Bathsheba or Psalm 32, you relate that to the book of 1 Samuel and the story of David or the book of 2 Samuel and the story, you know, you, 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 re, you relate it there, see. But each psalm has its own spot. Some of them you can't figure out what part of history they were written into. And you just have to, uh, yes, sir, Brother Monty Rommelman. Are they chronological in Psalms? No way. Not no, mm -mm. because here you've got uh, Psalm 90 in the middle, which is Moses, and all the way up there earlier you've got a bunch of Psalms of David, and Moses was hundreds of years before him, so somebody chunked them all in a box and swept them up into a pile, and they're more organized the way they are now. They're more organized in order, more thematically or topically or the different types instead of for the period of time they were written in. So, but it helps to understand how a book is put together. Again, though, when you're dealing with psalms, you're dealing with individual songs. Whereas when you're dealing with other books, you're looking at the whole book. Uh, each psalm is a whole book, really. It's, a, it's an individual unit that has to be dealt with separately. Okay, so um, now you've got books down here like Proverbs, most of the Proverbs were written by Solomon, so you're going to relate that to the book of First Kings. First Kings, that's this book right here, you're supposed to have relabeled it. Reyes means kings. First Kings, Second Kings. Alright? So, so Proverbs, Kings. Solomon messed up, but at least um, he wrote a lot of really good Proverbs, and, and in that Ecclesiastes he has some great wisdom, too bad he didn't apply it to his own life. So it's great to have wisdom, but it doesn't do you a whole lot of good if you're a double-minded man, unstable in all your ways, like uh, James said. James said, if you want wisdom, ask of God. Did Solomon do that? Yep, he did. But he said, let him ask in faith, meaning if you're going to ask God for his wisdom, when he gives you his wisdom, have enough faith to trust him and apply it to your own life. But Solomon didn't do a very good job of that part, did he? So he, he knew what to do. He just had a hard time uh, doing it. And then this little uh, cantaris here, that's the Song of Songs, the Song of Solomon, and his song about uh, uh, the blessed love of marriage and all that kind of stuff. Lamentations is written by Jeremiah. So you have to relate the book of Lamentations to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah's prophecy happened during King Josiah's reign. You know, remember the young king that found the book of the law and, and he led this great restoration movement and brought God's people back to doing good? And he didn't last very long. He died. And it may well have been when, when Josiah died that Jeremiah was so upset that he wrote the Lamentations. Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. Because he preached a whole lot and didn't make hardly any conversions. And he kept saying, if you don't repent, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. Guess what? They didn't, and it was. And he was right in the middle of it. They buried him in mud pits, and they did all kinds of stuff to him. But Lamentations goes with the book of Jeremiah and the book of Second Kings. See? Because in Second Kings, you read about all that. And Chronicles, too. Okay. Um, 
these different prophecies up here, like the, uh, excuse me, let's get down here where we can see it. These different prophets, you can tell by some of their prophecies when they preach. For example, everybody look up Isaiah 1 1. Isaiah 1 1 in your Bible. See, and this little chart will help you when you're studying the Bible, like when you're reading Isaiah 1 1. Carrie, have you got it looked up there? All right, so if you go over to the book of um, um, First and Second Kings, you'll find uh, these kings talked about, and you'll look up the parts that talk about. Uzziah and Jotham and Ahaz and Hezekiah and you read those parts those parts go along with the book of Isaiah see so Isaiah and the books of Kings go together you have to read those together and you do the same sort of thing with Jeremiah turn back to Jeremiah uh, chapter 1 and look there at verse 1 1 and 2 Jeremiah 1 1 and 2 how about now, Brother Monty? The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah. Hilkiah, one of the priests who were in Hannah, and the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. And it came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, and until the end of the eleventh year of Jedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the captivity of Jerusalem in the fifth month. It was fun listening to you do that, Monty. <laughs> uh, you, did, you say all those doctor no words. There's no Latin but, words in that. Uh, yeah, no, you, you can say them doctor words, but okay. Uh, you did good. Now, here's the thing. If you look at parts of the book of Isaiah and parts of the book of Jeremiah overlap, but if you read the book of Jeremiah... And the book of Second Kings, you'll see all those kings, and you'll see that those are the ones that led up to the destruction of Jerusalem and the captivity. So again, Jeremiah goes with those uh, particular ones in, in Second Kings. And down here, see, there's crossover in the books of Chronicles, because the book of Chronicles goes along with these story books, and you also read about these kings in the book of Chronicles. So Chronicles... Kings and these prophets, these go together. See, there's they're sort of parallel in what's happening there. But you look up the appropriate section in Kings and Chronicles, and you read that with the appropriate section in Isaiah and Jeremiah. See? And that's kind of the way you put this stuff together. Now, why didn't they tell us all that stuff? They just threw them in a box. And the way they threw them in the box doesn't make sense at all, according to all this kind of stuff. But when you actually read the books themselves, you put some of this stuff together. Now, I know that there's more to explain here, um, but let's just say, uh, let's just say right now, does anyone have a particular question about this particular chart that you'd like to ask, and then we'll go on to something different, Miss Francis? Oh. Okay, does he have a similar book? Well, you know, it's the daily. Oh, the chronological Bible. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and what, what she's saying is that the, the chronological Bible that he's put in order for daily Bible reading, Lagarde Smith, it helps you read more according to the chronological order of the story. And like he will put these appropriate prophets and stuff in the reading where the where the rest of the story is, and that is a very helpful tool uh, to help you get this. That's that's very good. Somebody else have a question or something you'd like to raise about this before we go on? Okay, all right. Let's go to the next little chart you've got, hopefully in your handout. But not this one. This one right here. Widen out a little bit. In the Old Testament canon, which is the books that they threw in the box, 
See, when we talk about the canon, we're talking about those inspired books that were recognized by God's people that they put in with the inspired book. One of my favorite um, passages about this in the Old Testament is Jeremiah 25, I think. Let me see here. Jeremiah... Twenty-five. Uh, no, okay. No, that's not what I'm looking. I'm looking at Daniel nine, Jeremiah twenty-five, eleven, and Daniel nine. Let's look at Daniel nine. I had it backwards here. Daniel nine, verse two, I think maybe. Yeah. Daniel nine, verse two. We're going to have some different translations here. I want to have a, a uh, American Standard, King James type of translation. Who's got an American Standard? Who's got one? In the English standard. Read the English Standard there in, in Daniel 9, verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, received in the books the number of the years that according to the word of the Lord, to Jeremiah the prophet must pass the end of of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. All right, so it says, I perceived in the books, plural, the books, the scrolls. Uh, What does the King James say there, Gary? Does it say the the books in Daniel 9, 2, I understood by the books? Yes, I understood by books. By by the books. He simply says the books. The, the, The NIV tries to explain what the books are and says the scriptures. And, and that's correct. That's a correct explanation. But what I want you to see is literally it just says the books. What do you mean the books? He means those that collection of books that they deem to be holy scripture. And in the synagogue, um, they had a big cabinet up at the front. And that cabinet, come on in, Courtney. You can come on back in. Okay, in in the cabinet uh, at the front, they had little little pigeonholes, and in the pigeonholes, they had stuck books all in there, scrolls. They were in the form of a scroll, you know, long and round and parchment and wound around bone or metal or whatever, and they had them stuck in pigeonholes up in the cabinet. So they would go up to the cabinet and open up the cabinet, and the synagogue attendant, like in Luke 4, would get the scroll of Isaiah and pull it out, and he'd hand it to Jesus, and Jesus would unroll it and read it. And then when Jesus was done, he'd roll it back up, give it to the guy, and he'd poke it back in a hole in there. See? The scroll of Isaiah. So they were all in their pigeonholes in there, however they were in there. Now, the sum total of the books in the cabinet, that was... The books that Jeremiah is talking about, or that Daniel is talking about. And here's the thing. Daniel says, in the first year of Darius, I understood in the books, in other words, the holy books, that the Babylonian captivity was 70 years. But if you go to Jeremiah 25, 11, what does he say, Mikey? And this whole land shall be a desolation and horror. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. All right, so what book do you know was in the, in the amongst the books? Jeremiah was in the amongst the books, and Daniel said, I understood from the books, meaning from the book of the prophet Jeremiah, that it was 70 years that the captivity would be. So there was just this collection of books. Now, here's the way the Jews arranged their collection. There's nothing holy about this particularly. Uh, It does make, though, quite a bit of sense. The law is the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And I want you to write on this chart uh, somewhere, Luke 24, verse 44. Most of the time in um, in the New Testament, the Old Testament books are referred to in either a twofold division or a threefold division. Sometimes it just talks about the law and the prophets. But sometimes it talks about the law, the prophets, and the writings, or the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. This third section over here in yellow was sometimes called the writings. And sometimes it was called the Psalms because the first book in it that kind of gave it its title was the book of Psalms, and then it went from there. Okay? 
Now, now looky here, very carefully. In the Hebrew Bible, the original Old Testament, the first book of the Bible is the book of Genesis. And the last book in the Bible is the book of Chronicles. Now, how can that be? Because that's the order they threw them in the box. Yeah. See? So, it went from Genesis to Chronicles. Now, everybody look up Luke 11, verse 50 and 51. Now, it had all the same books David makes. It had all the same books. But they just had them in a different order. More like our chart that we've been showing there, see? Now, if you'll look up Luke 11, verse 50 and 51. Everybody look that up. This kind of gives us a clue as to Jesus' Bible and the order of the books in Jesus' Bible that he was used to reading. And again, his Bible never was under one cover. Where was his Bible? It was in the cabinet in the cubby holes. See? we we got to get out of our mind this idea of it being under one cover. They were separate books, you know, 39 of them, stuck in the pigeonholes in a cabinet. See? And you on the front of the cabinet, it could say the Law, the Prophets, and the and the writings, but they never did have them under one cover. See, they were separate, free floating things inside the cabinet. All right, so let's read Luke 11, 50 and 51. Brother Joel, please. In order that the blood of all the prophets shed since the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the house of God. Yes. I tell you, it shall be charged against this generation. All right. The first, now notice the blood of all the prophets from the first to the last one that were killed. So the first righteous prophet of God killed in the Old Testament was Abel. What book was Abel killed in? Genesis chapter 4. But this dude, Zechariah, if you look up in the book of Chronicles, he was killed about Second Chronicles 23, somewhere in there. I don't, I'm not sure of the exact chapter, but it's in the latter chapters of Second Chronicles where he was killed. Now look at what Jesus said. Jesus said the blood of all the prophets from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah. In other words, from Genesis to Second Chronicles. See? Which shows you that this was the order of Jesus' books, okay, in the cabinet as he thought of them. Now, let me show you another one that shows you the same thing in a different way. Go to Luke 24, 44, like we wrote down in the first book. Luke 24, verse 44. Luke 24, verse 44, Brother Kenny, read it out where we can hear you. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. All right, now watch this. Everything written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms. He means this whole thing right here. See? First section, second section, third section. See, that goes right along with his other statement, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah. Okay? So, the, the Hebrew Bible that we have today, see, we have it under one cover, but all of those old scrolls that they had in the time of Jesus, uh, they printed them out with a printing press, and they've got them under one cover now. Now, the thing about the Hebrew Bible, see this Bible? You'd think we'd open it like this. But that would be wrong because to open the Hebrew Bible, we've got to turn it wrong side out. And this, the back is the front. I'm not playing with you. I'm telling you the truth. You read it that way. You don't read it that way. See? It's a left-handed Bible. That's exactly what it is. Now, let's look in here. Let's zoom in a little bit. This is the Hebrew Bible. And right up here is what I want you to see, which doesn't make too much sense, but I'm just going to show it to you anyway. These little words up here, this says Torah, meaning the law. 
This says the Nabi'im, meaning the prophets. And this says the Kasuvim, which means and the writings. The law, the prophets, and the writings. So you open up the book when you get past the introduction. And the first book is Genesis, Bereshit. And see, look at where chapter 1 starts over on the wrong side of the page over there. And you got to read that way. Okay? Isn't that weird? But then, look at here, you get to reading through this thing. And let's get down here to 2 Kings. It looks upside down. It looks upside down, doesn't it? Man, it's weird. It looks upside down. But, let's get over here to 2 Kings. Okay. Now, All right, Monty, you're you're a good Latin scholar. Say regum, that's kings. Regum. Yeah, this is kings, Second Kings. But look what's the next book right after Second Kings. Isaiah. Now, how in the world did you do that? Well, see, it doesn't look. It's not that way in our Bible, but it's it's you know you're getting into the uh, the prophets there, the, the other books of the prophets. Now let's go over here. We've got Jeremiah and all these, and we've got Ezekiel and and Habakkuk and uh oh, what Psalms doing after the book of Habakkuk? What Psalm? Let me. In fact, uh oh, we got a real problem going on here. <coughs> what do you think that book is right there? Malachi. Malachi. But let's keep going after Malachi. Uh oh, and after Malachi is the book of Psalms. How in the world did that happen? Because, see, when you get to the books of the prophets in the Hebrew Bible, it starts with Joshua, Judges, 1st Sec Samuel, 1st Sec Kings, and then Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. And that book of the Twelve is Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Zephaniah, you know, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. And so the end of the book of the Twelve is Malachi, okay? And what comes after Malachi? It's the writings. And the first book of the writings is the Psalms. And then when you get over here and you get here, we are at the Psalms and we're going backwards now. Because you have to go backwards and Jews are all backwards, see? And there's Job after Psalms. And I thought Job was supposed to be before Psalms. Well, it's after Psalms here, but it's still the same. And then there's Proverbs, and then there's... There's no reason because that's just the way they did it. That's just the the way they did it. This is the third section. And then, way down here at the end, you got Daniel, and then finally you got Ezra and Nehemiah here. See, Nehemiah. And then look what we've got bringing up the rear down here. Very last book in the Hebrew Bible, I wasn't making it up, is Second Chronicles. So when Jesus read about the last murder of the last prophet, Zechariah, in the book of Chronicles, and he read about the first murder of a righteous prophet of God, the murder of Abel, he said all the blood of the prophets of the whole thing, from the blood of Abel all the way to the blood of Zechariah, from the book of Genesis all the way to the end, to the book of Second Chronicles, will be held against this generation. So this is the way that Jesus thought of the books. And in Luke 24, see verse 44, he said, Everything had to be fulfilled which was written about me in the law and the prophets and the Psalms. Okay? Does that make sense? He he does that, but he he condenses it a little bit there in 27. It says, Moses and the prophets. Moses and the prophets. All the scriptures. That's right. And sometimes, like you say, they just refer to it as a twofold division. And basically, the priority was given to these two sections. These, these books over here were kind of looked at, looked at as they were inspired scripture that sort of informed and supplemented these books over here. The primary basis of Old Testament theology was this section right here. And another thing we might think of In the New Testament, when it talks about the fact that the law has been done away with, the law, I don't think we hear that right. Um, 
you know, the law was given through Moses, John 1, 17. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Jesus isn't talking about these books right here. He's talking about this. What was it that was done away at the cross? It wasn't these. It was this. It was these regulations that were done away at the cross. So there's a whole lot of things that, that you need to kind of rethink as far as what does the Bible mean when it says the law. <laughs> these books over here, these preachers that were preaching, they were trying to get the people to obey the what? This right here. See? And in the Psalms, when the psalmist says, Oh, how love I thy law, it is my meditation all the day, he's talking about this right here. See, these regulations about how to live. And when the king was supposed to have a copy of the law and read it night and day, see, this is what we're talking about here, the Torah. Okay? Now, all of it was Holy Scripture. But this part was just talking about how to obey this part right here. Now, there was a lot of divine instruction in the prophets as well. But most of the divine instruction in the prophets has to do with, you better obey my law. See, some of the instruction in the prophets was about what was going to happen in the future, which is prophecy about a future time. But this is the Old Testament canon. Okay? Now, did, would somebody like to ask some questions about anything in that? Anything you please? Each synagogue was set up the same way. I mean, they just by convention would set up these scrolls in the city. Well, the they didn't necessarily even have them in, in, in that order. What they would have is they'd probably have a cabinet up here, and over in one section of the cabinet, they would have the Torah scrolls, meaning scrolls of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Then they'd have a section that would probably say Nabi'im, prophets, and they'd have all the prophets chunked in that section, and in whatever order, you know. But from, from Jesus to, like you said, say from Genesis to Chronicles, there was some... There was a, there was a recognized order yeah, that they had. For some reason, the hymn was... Like that was the last book. The That's synagogues right. had to have some... Yep, they had to have some order of it. That's right. Brother uh, Brandon. Well, when you talk about the law, five books, but like the Ten Commandments, how do you... Well, the Ten Commandments is part of the law that was given by God to the Israelites at Mount Sinai. You you're referring to all five, uh, but you're mostly referring to the ordinances and statutes that were delivered by God to Moses on Mount Sinai that had to do with everything from thou shalt and thou shalt not to how you kill the bull and sacrifice it to what the priests are supposed to wear to... What are the dietary laws of clean and unclean? That's the law. That's the basis of the covenant. Okay? Joel, you act like you got a question. Got a question? Somebody ask a question if you got a question. Are the Psalms in the Hebrew Bible in the same order as ours? Yes. Yes, they are in the same order as, as in ours. Right. Okay, anybody want to ask anything else? This, we're not going to cover it all, but don't don't be afraid to say, well, what about this or what about that? I just pointed out to Carrie that it was ironic that in, in this, we're talking about Abel to Zachariah, that's for us what we always say, A to Z. And that's exactly right, from first to last. That's right. But that's kind of confusing to us because the last of our books is Malachi and we don't see any Zechariah get killed there, see? <laughs> and so what does that mean? But uh, this is the Old Testament canon. Okay? Now let me check my time here, see that I'm not going bonkers. It's 7.24. Now let me give you a, a preview of what we're going to do next time and then we'll boot you out of here. Next time, we're going to talk about how to understand a particular passage of Scripture. And we're going to talk about what do we mean by saying we're going to study the Bible in context. What do we mean by context? And you'll notice that the arrows are going both directions there. They're going forward and backward. And one of the things we're going to learn is that context is not just what came before a passage of Scripture. It's also what comes after 
a passage of Scripture that helps you to understand that particular passage of Scripture. And we're going to take some examples of how to study Scripture in context and what that really means. Okay? So, um, that's what we're going to do next time. Bring your bring your handout sheet with you next time. If you think... It's like, it's like me. I don't trust myself with some things. I don't know why, but I've proved to myself over and over that I can't be trusted in some areas. So, if you really can't be trusted to bring your notebook back with you, put your name on it and leave it on the front table up here. But if you will actually bring it back with you, like you could put it in your purse, Joel, and bring it back, then uh, go ahead and take it with you. Uh, that's what I'm saying. Is it a backpack or a purse? I'm, you know, so... Uh, we will see you next Wednesday, Lord. We will hang up.